Welcome to Life Talk. I'm Mark Crutcher, President of Life Dynamics in Denton, Texas. We've got a ton of information for you this month, but first, Alan Ackles is here with the news. Alan? Thank you, Mark. On Saturday, November 16th, a 26-year-old Virginia woman was apparently killed while undergoing an abortion at the Landmark Women's Center Abortion Mill in Alexandria. The exact cause of death has not yet been determined, but an unnamed source close to the case told Life Dynamics that there is evidence she was overdosed on a drug called Versed, which is commonly used to induce conscious sedation or twilight sleep prior to an abortion. The Alexandria Police Department issued a press release saying that they were investigating the incident. So far, the woman's name and the results of her autopsy have not been released. In Canton, Ohio, Paul Tarver has been sentenced to life in prison for his role in the shooting of his ex-girlfriend, Keisha Lewis, and causing the death of the couple's unborn son. Unhappy that Lewis refused to have an abortion, Tarver had a still unidentified gunman shoot Lewis, hitting her twice in the abdomen and once in the right thigh. The woman's two-year-old daughter was also in the truck but wasn't harmed in the attack. Life Dynamics President Mark Crutcher pointed out that pro-choice men killing and maiming women who refuse to have abortions is such a common occurrence that a new incident is reported on almost every edition of Life Talk. Crutcher stated, quote, Isn't it interesting that all these women are being shot, stabbed, strangled, and beaten up because of their views on abortion while the pro-choice community remains stone silent? Unquote. An Illinois abortionist is suing the pro-life group Small Victories in an attempt to stop them from carrying graphic photos of aborted babies in front of his Granite City death camp. Abortionist Yojendra Shah claims that the images are not only disturbing to children, but that one of his patients went into early labor because of them. The woman, Candace Howey, claims that her water broke within 10 minutes of seeing the posters, and despite giving birth to a healthy baby, she is seeking $45,000 in damages for emotional stress. Two spokespersons for the pro-life group, Angela and Daniel Michael, told Life Talk that it's pretty far-fetched to believe that seeing their posters would cause a woman to go into labor. In a subsequent incident at the same abortion mill, 64-year-old pro-lifer Don Horina was knocked to the pavement by a pro-choice man in his 20s after Horina told the man and his female companion who were leaving the facility that, quote, Jesus loves the little children, unquote. After assaulting Harina, the man chased two pro-life women, taking one of their signs and destroying it. One of the women who reported being chased is 80 years old. Daniel Michael told Life Talk that similar attacks on pro-lifers have not been prosecuted by local authorities, and he is considering a federal lawsuit to stop the violence. In Wisconsin, the YWCA is now dispensing birth control pills and condoms at its Milwaukee location. Although YWCA stands for Young Women's Christian Association, even employees of the organization appear to recognize that the Christian part of their name has little or no relevance. Crystal McNeil of the YWCA of Greater Milwaukee publicly stated that it has been a very long time since the organization focused on promoting Christian values. This particular YWCA also operates two medical facilities in partnership with America's number one abortion profiteer, Planned Parenthood. The Louisiana Supreme Court has ruled that a state law extending the statute of limitations for abortion malpractice cases to 10 years is constitutional. The statute also removes the damage cap that applies to other medical malpractice cases. Pro-abortion activists complain that civil lawsuits will now be used to make the economic risk great enough that doctors will stop offering abortions. Jennifer Achilles, president of the Greater New Orleans chapter of the National Organization for Women, said, quote, I think Louisiana was a test state. Why do we need Roe v. Wade if abortion is now a civil wrong and doctors are afraid to perform them?" Unquote. And in another court case, a New Jersey appeals court has ruled that a woman can sue her doctor for failing to tell her that her baby was a complete, separate, unique, and irreplaceable human being. Rosa Acuna brought a wrongful death and emotional distress claim against abortionist Sheldon Turkish claiming that when she asked Turkish whether her eight-week-old fetus was a baby, he said that it was, quote, just blood and tissue, unquote. The appellate court has found that the abortionist may be liable if he did not fulfill his duty to inform her of all the relevant medical information about her condition and the condition of her baby. The case will go to trial early in 2003. 
In Glendora, California, Daniel McCullough, director of the pro-life group Survivors, and another pro-lifer were arrested at Citrus College for using graphic signs to show the truth about abortion. According to Glendora Police, Lieutenant Tim Detch, school officials had the two arrested because they were holding the signs in areas not designated for free speech. McCullough says that he and Harry Rader were on public property while displaying the signs and that the arrest was a violation of their First Amendment rights. After watching the arrest, student David Alvarado of West Covina said, quote, Some students were wondering why these people were getting arrested. I guess there is no freedom of speech at Citrus College, unquote. Both men were released later in the day. In a similar situation, the Thomas More Law Center filed a civil rights suit in Rhode Island on behalf of 71-year-old Joseph Manning after local police confiscated his pro-life signs. Manning said that he and Barbara Burgess were holding photographs of aborted babies in front of the Women's Medical Center abortion mill in Cranston, Rhode Island, when police told them that they would be arrested if they didn't put the signs away. When they refused, the police confiscated them. Now Manning tells Life Talk that the city appears to be ready to settle and that the chief of police has apologized and returned the signs. Manning says that he hopes the lawsuit will send a message to other cities that if you mistreat pro-lifers, it'll cost you. And finally... A medical technician is suing a Minnesota hospital for religious discrimination after he was fired for counseling a patient against having an abortion. Donald Grant claims it was his religious obligation to dissuade a patient from killing her baby, and she did not object to his efforts, which included praying with her. But when a supervisor learned of the incident, Grant's employment was with the hospital was terminated. Grant said the hospital could have easily accommodated his request to transfer him to an area where he would not have contact with patients in similar circumstances, but chose instead to dismiss him. And Mark, that's Life Talk News for this month. Back to you. Thanks, Alan. Like I said, we've got a ton of information for you here, and I'm joined by Melissa. Hello, Melissa. Hello, How are you doing? Mark. Pretty good. Well, we had a survey we sent out to all our Life Talk viewers. And, we sure uh, did. We, we sent it out a couple of weeks ago, and so far, we have thankfully received about 25% of the responses back. Yeah. And in Which is amazing. These, we thought we'd get right. 10 percent back or so something. So we we really appreciate those of you that took the time to fill it out and send it back because we want your feedback so we can make sure that the right. the show is is catering to your needs. Now, basically, the responses were as we expected, but we did have a few surprises. First of all, many of you expressed that you didn't think the show was too long and you preferred the old live talk format. But most surprisingly, is that many of you do not see it as a as a priority to put Life Talk on okay. cable access. Well, I think the biggest problem that we ran into was not that they didn't see it as a priority or didn't want to do it, mm -hmm. but the cable systems make it very difficult because right. every one of them has a different format. Mm -hmm. We thought if we put a 30 minute or a 28 minute and 30 second format out there that everybody could just take it in and plug it in. Right. That's not what's happened. And so, um, and I think that's one reason a lot of you said we prefer the old single Life Talk format, which you now can tell we went back to. So the recon thing is gone. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it, we'd have problems with one cable system saying it could be 50% locally produced and 50% and produced outside the area, and another cable saying it could be 5%. Right. Some of them say, no, we'd do it just like it is. So we appreciate everybody right. putting in the attempts, but I know a lot of the cable operators have been giving you the runaround by saying you need a, right. a more expensive format and so forth. But for those of you that do have it on cable access, we appreciate that. And One of the things that service. people asked too, Melissa, was what, to, what I, must, I, I want to continue getting live talk. I love the show. I watch it every month. But my tapes are stacking up. I've got four years almost worth of tapes now. What am I going to do with all right. these tapes? And I and I understand that. But the important thing is, is we don't want your tapes one to take up space too much space in your home. But also, we don't want them to not be used. So what you can do is you can donate them to your local church or community library. You can pass them on to people that may be pro-life but not too much into the right, pro-life right. movement. You can um, play them for your youth group or church Bible study. And or donate them to a CPC. Right, and right. We're, we're seeing a lot of CPCs are using it as valuable tools. Many people um, work at the CPC aren't quite up to date on the, right. on the issues. Right, a lot of people, a lot of particularly women who get convicted of the pro-life cause and say, I'm not going to be a part of the pro-life movement, mm -hmm. but I'll volunteer at the CPC. So they go there, right. they get wrapped up in that, but they don't really know what's going on outside that little world. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, they'll call us with very simple questions that everybody ought to know. Right. And so those people, I think, would really benefit from getting the, the tape. So if your tapes are stacking up and you don't use them for, for research or something like that, you know, think about donating them to somebody. Um, anyway, we also had uh, lots of good information, I mean, lots of good news this year on the political front. Sure. The elections really went our way. 
As many of you are already aware, Republicans swept the polls this year. More importantly, pro-life. Pro-life Republicans. Right. Now, um, the victories were, were for pro-life, pro-lifers, but uh, what we need to remind people, Mark, and I know you, you feel very strongly about this, is we can't rest yet just because there's pro-life Republicans yeah, in these right. positions. We need to, as, as you say, hold their feet to the fire. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, and yeah, we did have across-the-board wins. I mean, it, it was a rout. Even the pro-aborts are not able to put a spin on it and make it look anything other than like a, right. the route that it was. Uh, but again, the issue is not whether pro-life Republicans won or pro-life Democrats won. The issue is what are they going to do? Um, and there's, there are some things, you, you, you hate to be the person that reigns on the parade, but there's some things that we need to keep in mind here. First off, it was not a, an overwhelming sweep. It was, a, it was a minor shift which went from the Democrat side to the, pro, uh, for, to the Republican side. In reality, in, 2000, in the year 2000, there were 50 Republican senators. Now there are 51. So it isn't like there was this massive uh, onslaught over to the pro-life Republican side. The other thing is, um, you've, you've heard me talk about in, in past shows that I, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of the, of the effort to ban partial birth abortion because it doesn't save any babies. We're, we're using a tremendous amount of pro-life resources to pass legislation that doesn't save any babies. Every baby that would be killed with a, with a partial birth or DNX abortion would simply be killed with a DNE or a saline or a hysterotomy or a ditch or whatever other method they use. You're not going to tell me that if a guy, if, if, a, if one of these baby killers is about to kill a baby with a partial birth abortion and his nurse runs in and says, Doc, you can't do that, they just outlawed partial birth abortion, that he's going to let this baby go and, and, and give this woman her money back. He's just going to do a DNE, which is every bit as horrific as, as, a, as a partial birth. So the problem with partial birth abortion, and this is something that I warned you about on, in past shows, that it's going to come back to haunt us in the political arena, and I think it's starting to now. Because what's happening is the Republicans are saying, okay, you elected us to office, now we're going to give you the partial birth abortion ban. Trent Lott, the day after the elections, was out here saying, mm -hmm. now we'll pass it, and Bush will sign it, and, and it'll become law. Yeah, but it doesn't save any babies. Right. But it gives the Republicans a chance to say to the pro-life community, okay, now, we did something for you, go away and leave us alone. It's a bone they're throwing to us, and it's a bone that has no meat on it. So we've got to be so very... It's, it's our responsibility as pro-lifers to right. watch the agendas of the politicians in our state and make sure they're not finding little loopholes like that, that right. they're actually exactly. instating stuff that saves babies. Right. You know, uh, Melissa, we uh, started out, actually, we started out with the Action Card Campaign, mm -hmm. uh, which is the little business cards that have the pro-life sayings on them that people can leave everywhere. And uh, we started that, actually, before you came to, to Life Dynamics, and we have sold... I think the last count, about 250,000 of the action cards. They're everywhere. And, of course, we get a lot of calls from businesses saying, hey, I, you left these in my place. Don't, I don't like this. I'm pro-choice. And, you know, we <laughs> got a threat. It's a good threat. tool. That's why yeah. they don't like it. Uh, but what we've noticed lately is that uh, the sale of action cards has tapered off. I don't know if it's because you've got enough of them, you bought enough of them to, say, to keep for a while. But if you're not doing action cards, you need to be doing these. These things are very, very effective. And, uh, so, and they're very cheap, $2.50 a right. hundred. Um, and just a clarification, when Mark says sales are down, that doesn't dishearten us because we're making a profit. We sell these, of course, at, at our cost. Right. The reason it's, it's alarming is because they're such a powerful tool. I leave right. them in restrooms. Right. A lot of people m put it in everything they mail out. So leave it's a good with tool tips for you. At restaurant. We've got a whole list that we'll send you of places you can use them. Right. And they're very, very effective. Um, speaking of cards, one thing that's really aggravating, Planned Parenthood is sending out a Christmas card. Now, of course, it doesn't have any Christian message on it. It says... Um, <laughs> Choice on earth. Mm -hmm. Take off on peace on earth, obviously. Um, it's, it's obscene. It, it is, it, but it shows these people's mindsets. Right. Um, on a little happier note, we've got a new product I think you're really going to like. Um, we've been looking for a way for years to deliver the pro-life message to the American people in a, in, a, in a different way, something that they may not have uh, seen in the past. They may get tired of the, of the rhetoric that we've used. So we developed a campaign called... Let my people grow. Right. We've got a new t-shirt. It shows a little, it actually is a, a picture of, uh, it's a rendition of Moses as a baby. Right. Uh, leading a lot of little babies. And you're seeing the t-shirt on the screen right now. And by the way, how about that model? Yeah. Hey. Is that the cutest model you ever saw? Who is I, that kid? How come my shirt doesn't look that good uh, on right, me? <laughs> right. Um, uh, for those you may not know, that's my daughter, Sheila. And um, the... What we're trying to do here with this, with this image is we're trying to reinforce to people that a born child and an unborn child are exactly the same. 
And we often make distinctions between unborn and born children in our own rhetoric by constantly talking about unborn children or preborn children or whatever we choose to call them. Um, and that kind of separates them out. This shirt, we hope, lumps them back together. And it, it's also a good conversational starter, you know, just, just like the baby feet. A lot of people say, well, what is that? And it gives you an opportunity to talk right. about the pro-life stance. Well, when I was in the grocery store, somebody complimented and said, oh, you know, that's precious. And I said, oh, did you see the writing? And they read Stop Abortion Now. And, and you know, their eyes kind of got big. And I said, well, what's your, what's your position on abortion? And, and a lot of people say, well, I don't ever think about it. It doesn't apply to me. So this is going to cause a lot of people to, th right. to think about the issue. which and is, it's, And it's a pro-life shirt that you can wear without feeling like you're, you're in somebody's face with a, you know, some of our other shirts right. are, more, are more, like I say, in your face and, and hitting them right between the eyes with pro-life. This is more subtle, and it's humorous in a way. And, and um, anyway, the shirts are available. They're $14.95 plus $2.50 shipping and handling. It's a great Christmas gift. Right, it would be. Um, we got a couple of other things I want to talk to you about. Uh, speaking about Republicans, one of the things that's happened just in the last couple of days that I am just, uh, I, don't, I don't even know how to describe this situation. Um, as you may know, Dick Armey, who is one of the most conservative and one of the most well-known um, our so-called conservatives in the in the uh, Congress is retiring. He's not going to run for another term, and he's the congressman from this area. Um, always claimed to be strong, strongly pro-life and, and uh, pro-family and so forth. He has announced that uh, when he retires, he's going to go work for the ACLU. Now for I, I mean, it's you, just it's. Right. I, I don't even know what to say, Melissa. Go, go ahead. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, the the ACLU is the American Civil Liberties Union, right. and this is as liberal as you can get. I went yesterday onto their website, and one of their major platforms right now, the issues they're they're pursuing, is they want to take away any kind of parental involvement in abortion services to minors. I mean. It, this is one of the most radically left, hardcore, mm -hmm. for, you may not know this, Melissa, the ACLU was started by a man named Roger Baldwin, who was an avowed, open communist. The man didn't pick any bones about it. He's a communist. And now here you have Dick Army, who knows what this organization is about. They are the antithesis of everything that we all stand for, and Dick Army's going to go to work for the ACLU. And you had a great analogy to, to let people understand this more clearly. Well, the, yeah, it'd be like, you know, if, if they're going to work on privacy issues, which is right. abortion, by the way. He said he's going to work with them on privacy issues, which is their, one of the things is abortion. But, you know, I'm sure Dick Army would say, well, I don't have to agree with everything they do in order to, to go right. to work for them. Well, what if it was the Ku Klux Klan? What if the Klan said, we want to talk about privacy issues too, would you come to work for us? Would he say, well, I'd go to work for the Klan, they don't, I don't believe everything they believe. Well, no, he wouldn't do that, obviously. That'd be a PR nightmare. Right. Why, why would this man go to work for the ACLU? I mean, it, it boggles the mind. Now, one other thing here. We have identified, and you're seeing on your screen right now, this um, order. This is an order from a wholesale drug company for RU-46. So now we have identified one of the wholesale companies that's selling RU-46. It's H.D. Smith in uh, Springfield, Illinois. They have, they have offices all over the United States, but their home office is in Springfield, Illinois. Um, this is one of the companies. If you're in the drug purchasing business or if you're a company or if you're a physician or whatever and you buy drugs, you might want to think about this. These people are involved in the baby killing business. Um, thanks, Melissa. You did a great thanks, job on Mark. the stuff, especially on the political stuff. Um, one last thing now. On November 11th, 12th, and 13th, a Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, station broadcast a three-part series on our child predator campaign. And we thought you'd like to see a, a shortened version of that report here on Life Talk. Then I'll be back with some exciting news about a new video we're about to release. You're watching WB33 News at 9. People that, that harbor men who prey on, on these young girls are as guilty as the men who do it. They ought to be in jail. Are men who exploit children getting a free ride from family planning and abortion centers? WB33 looks into allegations of wrongdoing inside North Texas clinics. There are allegations tonight that some family planning and abortion clinics aren't following a critical law meant to protect children. In a three-month investigation, WB33 uncovered disturbing and possibly illegal activity. WB33's Don Tongish has more in this exclusive on-target investigation. 
The law we're talking about requires employees of these clinics to report suspected child abuse. Now, these facilities see a lot of underage girls who could be victims of abuse. But a North Texas undercover operation shared exclusively with WB33 reveals the law is possibly being ignored. Thank you for calling Planned Parenthood. I'm going to be 14 in March. It's a call that should cause alarm. I was wondering if you guys do abortions there. She says she's a 13-year-old child. But my boyfriend's 22. Pregnant by an older man. In the eyes of the law, that's sexual assault. The man could go to jail. Well, would you have to tell anybody that I was no, on birth control? Uh, everything's confidential here. Confidential? Oh, okay. That's not what the law says. So Employees who work for family planning centers and abortion clinics are considered mandatory reporters. If a worker even suspects child abuse, that employee is obligated to tell authorities. If a girl is beneath the age of consent and she is sexually active, by definition, that is evidence of sexual abuse. Mark Crutcher, an activist with a pro-life agenda, says he has evidence North Texas centers are failing to report the sexual abuse of minors. The abortion industry consistently goes out here and talks about how much they care about these girls and how much they're trying to serve these girls. And, and you know, what we discovered, of course, is that basically they're running a pedophile protection racket. Crutcher, who founded Life Dynamics in Denton, earlier this year says his group taped telephone calls to more than 800 family planning and abortion clinics across the country, including 18 in North Texas. Thank you for calling Planned Parenthood. Life Dynamics staged a scenario in which the caller, an adult, claimed she was a 13-year-old girl pregnant by her 22-year-old boyfriend. The girl doesn't want anyone to find out. Well, does anybody have to know about, like, getting a pregnancy test? No. Now? Nobody has to know anything. You just walk in, you can be 10 years old and walk in and get a pregnancy test, and nobody has to... Oh, okay. Anybody. But local right. police, okay. child abuse okay. investigators tell us a minor asking for a pregnancy test, okay. even birth control, should like prompt a report. But in this call to Trinity Valley okay. Women's Clinic in Fort okay. Worth, it seems well, that isn't this a problem. You sure no one would have to know about me and my boyfriend or anything? Uh-uh. Okay. No, not, not to do pregnancy tests or birth control pills. Anything but an abortion. Nobody has to know. Okay. Yeah. You don't even have to show your ID when you do the pregnancy test. Okay. In another call to Dallas, the employee sounds like she's coaching the girl to hide her abuser's age. So nobody would find out about him? We, would, we don't even want to know about him because technically we would have to report him to the cops. Oh. Okay. Like I said, that's statutory rape. Oh. And statutory means that in the legal books, in the penal code, it says that if you are having sex with a person who is two years younger than you, Mm -hmm. then that's considered rape. Some centers around the country and in North Texas told the girl they would report. But Life Dynamics says in 91% of the calls, the a people on the phone test. agreed Those to cover up the relationship. Well, if it, what if it said that I wasn't pregnant? I mean, if, it's, if you're not pregnant, it's not that, well, I don't want to say it's not that big of a deal. It's just we don't have to report if, it's not, if you're not pregnant. She should have immediately... Uh, uh, on the phone and getting information. I mean, she's a trained medical provider, I assume. We played the tapes for state lawmaker Phil King, who is also an attorney. The pro-life Republican was troubled by what he heard. She should have been getting information, been exceptionally concerned that a 22-year-old had had sexual relations with a 13-year-old. But all they were concerned about, as you could tell, was telling her how to get this abortion. This is against the law and they're selling their procedure. Carol Everett, who was on the task force that wrote the laws for abortion clinics, says the centers are ignoring their legal obligations. That is a sick relationship that needs to be stopped immediately, and the clinic has a responsibility to report that information to Child Protective Services in the state of Texas, if not to the authorities in the city. In a written statement, Planned Parenthood told us they comply fully with child welfare reporting obligations, but a spokesperson refused to do an interview because, Catherine Ellen writes, Planned Parenthood questions the reliability of staged tapes prepared by an organization with a notorious anti-Planned Parenthood agenda. We have over 8,000 files. Crutcher doesn't deny his agenda. He wants the abortion industry shut down. And he says the tapes help bolster his goal. Sure. We're a pro-life organization. I'm very pro-life and I think these people ought to be put out of business. And here is more evidence that I'm right. We asked Planned Parenthood to provide us evidence that Crutcher is wrong, that they do tell authorities. They refuse to provide us with any reports. 
Crutcher now plans to start filing lawsuits across the country against these facilities. He says to further his goal of shutting them down. Don Tongish, WB33 News at 9. And for more information on what Texas laws say about... You're watching WB33 News at 9. Again and again, these people encouraged her to lie, encouraged her to deceive her parents, encouraged her to um, violate state law. A pro-life group ran a sting operation targeting abortion clinics and family planning centers. Now they say they've uncovered practices that may be putting children in jeopardy. The pro-life organization that conducted the undercover operation claims some North Texas clinics are ignoring laws that protect children. All clinics are required to report suspected sexual abuse and they're required to tell a parent if a minor is trying to get an abortion. But are they? WB33's Don Tongish has more in this on-target investigation. The parental notification law is intended to keep parents in the loop in what is a very difficult decision, a minor seeking an abortion. But the North Texas sting operation shared exclusively with WB33 reveals what may be attempts to cut parents out of that process. Mark Crutcher, who founded the pro-life organization Life Dynamics in Denton, says he has evidence of widespread disregard for the law. I mean, you know, I'm not even supposed to be telling you this. So. Life Dynamics staged no more than 800 calls to clinics across the country. Crutcher says in 91% of the calls, they found violations of the law. Life Dynamics also found evidence the parental notification law is not being followed. Trinity Valley Women's Center. This call came to Trinity Valley Women's Clinic in Fort Worth, where the caller is first encouraged to tell a parent. How about telling your mom? You would be surprised at how understanding they can be. I mean, they never listen to me. I mean, they don't understand anything. Then listen to what's suggested next. It sounds like the employee is telling the caller to bring in a man willing to pose as a parent. Gosh, even if he was older, I mean, we have to see their driver's license. Okay. We can't prove that, that they're not your mom or dad. We don't, you know, they just have to swear uh, on an affidavit here in our office that says that they uh, are your, you know, parent. Yeah, I see. I mean, you know, I'm not even supposed to be telling you this, so, but there's no way that I can know for a fact that, that who you bring in here is not your mom or dad. The next day, okay. the caller talks to the same employee. I was talking to my boyfriend, and I told him what you said about uh, getting someone to come in that was old enough to look like my dad. Yes, yes, yes. Well, um, he's got an uncle who's 50 who said he would do it. Well, as long as he doesn't tell me he's not your father, then we're all right. Here is an adult saying, go out and find you somebody who looks old enough to be your daddy and bring him in and we'll uh, we'll know that he's not your daddy but just make sure he doesn't say that to us and we'll let him sign uh, sign the parental consent documents we'll even notarize them for you and send them off to the state i mean it's outrageous with that clinic may help you this call came into west side clinic in fort worth where an employee suggests sending a letter that may or may not reach a parent basically what it is is you're going to give me your name and you're going to have to send a certified letter to a parent and if that letter comes back to us it doesn't matter even if it comes back it's returned it doesn't get to your parents and after 48 hours if we don't hear anything from anybody or we get the letter back we can schedule you for an appointment even though you're underage okay but you're sure my parents wouldn't find out that way well like i said we we have to at least attempt to uh reach a parent they're circumventing the process and they're um, uh, they're getting around the law and Again, what you heard committed was a crime. State lawmaker Phil King, who helped write the parental notification law, listened to the tapes and was stunned by the boldness. You know, if they were worried about getting caught, they would say, well, before we talk, come in in person and let me meet with you. They aren't even doing that. They're doing it over the phone. So that tells me they're doing it all the time. It's very offensive. I'm very disappointed and troubled. Even King's Democrat counterpart, Dale Tillery, who is pro-choice, thought the clinics went too far. This is a violation of the law. It's not a loophole. It's not legal to do this. It's illegal conduct. The tapes have raised questions about what is really going on inside the clinics. Some lawmakers are calling for an investigation by the Attorney General. And so is Crutcher. If it's true, then what you're looking at here is the largest criminal conspiracy in American history. If that doesn't justify a full-scale investigation by every state in this country into these family planning organizations, I don't know what would.
A formal inquiry could soon be on the way. The State Department of Health, which regulates abortion clinics, is considering an investigation. And the Attorney General, John Cornyn, has contacted us. He wants to hear the tapes. Don Tongish, WB33 News at 9. You're watching WB33 News at 9. Without these children walking through the front doors of these abortion clinics, a, a very significant percentage of their profit would walk out the door. Allegations tonight by a Denton pro-life group that some family planning centers and abortion clinics may not be reporting possible sex abuse victims. The market to provide reproductive health services, including abortion, can be a profitable one. So profitable, one pro-life organization based in Denton claims some North Texas clinics may possibly be willing to break the law. WB33's Don Tongish has more in her on-target investigation. This undercover operation shared exclusively with WB33 reveals what may be widespread disregard for laws that shield kids from abuse. The pro-life organization that initiated this sting believes that these clinics are failing to protect children, choosing profits instead. They're not interested in coming out and saying, oh yeah, we cover up for pedophiles all the time. They're not going to say that. So the only way to do that was to go undercover. Mark Crutcher, who founded the pro-life organization Life Dynamics in Denton, spearheaded the sting. Thank you for calling Planned Parenthood. We're looking at the largest criminal conspiracy in American history, and the, and the victims are children. Trinity Valley Women's Center. This call came to Trinity Valley Women's Clinic, where it seems the employee suggests a way around the law that says a parent must be notified before a minor gets an abortion. The employee talks about bringing in a man to pose as a parent. We took the tape to that clinic in Fort Worth to get an explanation. Linda, is she here? I'm asking you to go ahead and leave. Okay, so she's not here. What time will she be back in the morning? I have no idea. There's no comments. Please leave. We did reach the clinic employee by phone. If I walk in this door and say, I'm not really her parent, then okay. I'll say, bye bye. We played the tape, confronting her with her own recorded voice. I can tell you that I told her that uh, she has to sign a sworn affidavit putting her life in jeopardy if she's not the true parent. What were you trying to tell her about uh, bringing someone in who is old enough to be her parent? Very much. We also wanted to get answers from Westside Clinic in Fort Worth. In a call that came in there, an employee suggested sending a letter that may or may not reach a parent. And if that letter comes back to us, it doesn't matter. Even if it comes back, it's returned, it doesn't get to your parents. And after 48 hours, if we don't hear anything from anybody or we get the letter back, we can schedule you for an appointment even though you're underage. At the clinic, we found a woman who said she was the director. So that wouldn't be something that you would tell them that would be okay if the letter came back to you? No. Well, that's what Dawn told a, a girl. Dawn told her that. Mm -hmm. Did Dawn make a mistake in doing that? No, she didn't make a mistake because that's not what she was told. And that's not what she said. So. Well, then you would probably like to hear this tape. I've got it right here. We can go in a back room and you can listen to it. That's okay. You can play it to the corporate office if you want. We tried to call that corporate office. The phone has been off the hook for weeks. We also wanted to get answers from clinics accused of violating the law requiring medical providers to report suspected child abuse. Police investigators say a minor seeking a pregnancy test or birth control should prompt a report. In a written statement, Planned Parenthood told us they fully comply with child welfare reporting obligations, according to a spokesperson, Catherine Allen. But in this call to one of their centers, an employee indicates a girl getting a pregnancy test won't trigger a report. Well, does anybody have to know about, like, getting a pregnancy test? No. Nobody has to know anything. You just walk in, you can be 10 years old and walk in and get a pregnancy test, and nobody has to tell anybody. These clinics don't care about minors, or they wouldn't be talking to that child that way. Carol Everett used to own abortion clinics. She says it was standard practice to target teens, seen as likely repeat customers. 
Everett says in the calls, the only concern seems to be the clinic's bottom line. If it were truly about helping the girl, as they would stop the telephone call, say, tell your parents we cannot help you. But this is a potential client who has the money to come into their clinic. Crutcher, too, believes the clinics are cashing in on their crimes. If the market for minors goes away, he says, so does a lot of money. Without these children walking through the front doors of these abortion clinics, a, a very significant percentage of their profit would walk out the door. An abortion can cost up to $400. Two years ago in Texas, more than 4,000 underage girls got abortions. Add it up, and Crutcher says the clinics have one lucrative reason to keep on serving these girls despite the law. Don Tongash, WB33 News at 9. Well, you know, I've told you in the past that the pro boards don't play defense well, and I think this series that you just watched proves that point. Um, and WB33 has assured us that they are going to have a follow-up to this series in the future. They're, they're also doing some of their own investigation. Um, I also want to let you know, I, I told you a moment ago, we have a new video coming out, and it will include this WB33 information and some other additional uh, information, plus some clips from tapes all over the United States. It's going to be a 30-minute piece. We're going to have it available here in just the next few weeks, and so we'll be letting you know about that. It's going to be something you can show to, to meetings or get on cable access or whatever you want to do, and it will really let people know what's going on in this uh, child predator deal. It is a national disgrace and something we need to do about it, and it's something that can really devastate the abortion industry. It, it is something they cannot deal with, as you can see from the WB33 piece. They don't know what to say about it. Um, I'm joined now by... Rusty Thomas from Waco, Texas. He was here with us last month. Hello, Rusty. How are you? How you doing, brother? Well, you know, Rusty, you are the first guy we've ever had on Life Talk two months in a row. I'm speechless. You know, we were teasing about uh, Flip has always wanting to get in front of the cameras that are rolling. Now we found out we have a new king of that. Of that oh, <laughs> right. Well, listen, um, we discovered right after you left here that there's some other things happening down in Waco. You're kind of in a hotbed of pro-life activity down there uh, with the library. Tell us what's going on there. Well, apparently, uh, Mark, for the last uh, year or so, behind the scenes, uh, there was a deal uh, worked out between the former librarian, Pamela Bunnell, and Pam Smallwood, which is the executive director of the Planned Parenthood in Central Texas. Well, uh, well wait, what's, what's the link between Planned Parenthood and a library? Well, they, they uh, were working together behind the scenes to make Planned Parenthood an actual satellite uh, library, a functional branch of the uh, public library. Well, lo and behold, it comes out in the newspaper that this is an, uh, a done deal. And so I called for a press conference to uh, discuss kind of the moral, spiritual, legal, and right. every other kind of issue uh, associated with this. And I called it an unholy alliance between the city of Waco and uh, Planned Parenthood. Well, we gave the statement. It was a powerful rebuke uh, to the city of Waco to allow this league between this uh, uh, organization and them. I mean, it's an odious organization. This is an organization that slays children right. uh, for blood money. It promotes uh, immorality, fornication, adultery, homosexuality. Uh, and now you have uh, evidence of uh, right. them being used uh, by the pedophiles to cover up their crimes right. uh, against young people. And, and, so, and it's not like they're inadvertently being used. They're knowingly being used. Absolutely. They're selling pedophiles protection. That's what this is a protection racket is what this is. And so we you know, we, we even gave them the background on Margaret Sanger and right. the, their 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 racist the genocidal agenda. And, and and we just basically called upon the city of Waco. You must sever this unholy alliance with this odious organization. Is the press helping you out? Well, I'll tell you what, we did we did the press conference. The next day some things came to light. And some of those things that came to light, well, th there is some discrepancies going on here. Number one, the now librarian, Betty Crook, denies the assertion that Planned Parenthood is a branch of McLennan County Public Library. Well, we have documentation on Planned Parenthood uh, literature that they're saying they are a branch. Right. So somebody's lying. Right. All right. Number two, Kathy Rice, the city manager, admitted in the newspaper, yeah, they did this without any input whatsoever from the library board or the city council. Yeah. And so we... So this was a, back, a, a smoke-filled room kind of deal. I mean, they got behind the scenes and they said, we're going to make Planned Parenthood part of the library system. 
And, you know, Rusty, the, the reason that I wanted to have you back on here to talk about this is, um, is that this, I think, is... Waco may be being used as a test bed by Planned Parenthood to see if they can pull something like this off. Because, Rusty, their agenda for the last 30 years has been to mainstream Planned Parenthood and to mainstream abortion into our community. Absolutely. And, you know, what better way to mainstream Planned Parenthood into a community than to get it aligned with the library? Right, and with the backing of the city government. And this was my point with the city of Waco. You have given credence, you have given legitimacy to right. an organization that's a private right. organization that understands they're in business. And what is their business? To, to uh, peddle birth control, right. sell abortions, right. all right? And like any other business, they have to increase their client base in order to thrive. And that's what this is all about. Absolutely. they got to get their literature right. into the hands of our young people to activate them sexually in order to justify their services. Now, let me ask you a question, Rusty. This is a public library, right? right. Planned Parenthood is now a public library. That's like, what they said. Right. Now, are they allowing then, I assume, just anybody who wants to walk in off the street can walk into Planned Parenthood? Well, Brother Mark, we, uh, at the press conference, when we exposed these shenanigans to the community, uh, we had four of our ladies that were there. This was an open house. The, the community was invited to visit the public library. Well, four of our ladies were denied access based solely on their belief system. In other words, Taxpayers, just like everybody else, right. but because you are Christian and because you are pro-life, we are not going to allow you to come to the public library. Is that what Planned Parenthood told them? And they turned them away at the door? Absolutely. All right. Turned them away. You were telling me last night that not only are they doing this, they're not even ashamed of it. They've written it down. Yes. Uh, on the website, they, they pretty much said, if you have protested Planned Parenthood in the past, you're not welcome to our library and you will be denied access. Now, and this is what happens, you, you know, Mark, when you're, when you're in a, a position where you have to defend the indefensible. Right. In other words, if, if your first fundamental right to life is not secure, then what other right is secure? So now they're going to tell the, 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 a citizen of the state of Texas that a, there's a public library that you cannot walk into simply because you have in the past opposed abortion. That's the, what they're saying. That's the message they're sending. Right. And so we are working feverishly right now to unravel this mess and sever this alliance. And, and this is why this program is really important, uh, Brother Mark, because we have got to inform uh, our nation and different cities. Like you're saying, if, if this is a test case, if they're floating the balloon in Waco, you better believe that they have plans to see this implemented right. in other cities throughout America, and so we've got to keep our eyes open and our ears open. But you know, you know something, Rusty? Even if it wasn't a, a concerted effort, and they designed this as a test. It is a test. Whether they designed it as such or not is beside the point. Right. If, if Planned Parenthood in, in Waco is successful with this, then you can bet at the next Planned Parenthood annual convention they're going to be featured speakers and saying, now let me tell you how we've ingratiated ourselves to the local community and, and become part of the mainstream community. We actually became a branch of the library, and here's how you do it. Well, I'm going to tell you, uh, the Central Texas uh, Planned Parenthood, they received an award from National Planned Parenthood for providing services under duress. In other words, Waco Pro-Lifers, you've been doing a That's very exactly good right. job. You guys have been doing a good job down there. But um, all this, of course, was going on without your knowledge. And that's when I saw that right after you were here last, last month, I said, you know, we've got to get Rusty back because I still believe if this is going on in Waco, it's going on somewhere else. And um, so I, I thank you for, for bringing this to all our, uh, our attention and, and um, keep us posted on what's going on down there. I sure will, Mike. And thanks for coming back. Nice to see you again. Bless you, buddy. Listen, if you're not paying attention to this, you may wind up one day finding out that the Planned Parent in your community is, is joined up with a library or whoever knows, who knows what other services they may be joined up with. So you've got to be paying attention, figuring out if these guys are trying to sneak in somewhere, and this is a good place that, they, uh, that you need to be looking. Um, Sonny Four Acres here to tell us what Pastors for Life is up to, and he'll be joining me next. Welcome back.
Welcome back. I'm joined by Sonny Four Acre from Pastors for Life. Hello, Sonny. How are you doing? I'm doing terrific. Glad to be here today. Well, tell us what Pastors for Life is up to these days. We've been busy. Um, obviously, the, uh, this particular tape and information going out has caused a lot of people to call us, write to us. We've been able to communicate with as uh, many people far away, such as Oregon, Colorado, uh, Illinois, Ohio, sending information to them to help them begin Pastors for Life. It only takes one pastor with a heart and a passion to get involved in this issue. Right. And, um, and so if we give them resources, they're able to start locally. And now, you know, you mentioned uh, to me before that, of course, we rotate you with, with uh, um, Father Provone from Priest for Life. And although you are basically trying to accomplish the same thing, you, do a, you use a little bit different strategy. He's more of a big uh, national organization trying to get things done on a national level. You try more to go into a community and get the local pastors and the local priest or whatever to, right. to get on board. Exactly. Uh, pastors for Life is uh, non-denominational. It's across all denominations. So we don't have a national organization. What we try to do is get pastors in a local area who have a passion to get involved and do something in their area, and we go in to help them. We've, we've even written a resource manual to show them how to get started by, uh, like we did in South Carolina, and they then follow that instruction, follow that line, and they can start their own group. Now, what um, you tell me about there's a meeting going on today that you, you missed because of coming here, but uh, what's that all about? Well, we in the, in the Houston area have been desiring to have a Pastors for Life there. I mean, there's, there's thousands of churches in Houston, and yet Houston is the third largest abortion provider city in the nation. And so we want to make a presence there. So today there is a group meeting. And uh, we hope to begin to build this and increase the circle and get pastors involved to go down to the clinics and provide a presence in prayer to make a difference. It hasn't been happening. They haven't had the leadership. Right. And do you think you'll be able to then to replicate that in other, in other cities around the country? That, that oh, absolutely. Um, there's no doubt that once the, the pastors are there giving leadership not only to their congregations but to the pro-life community as a whole, people get involved. They see leadership. They see someone speaking uh, out and prophetically, and people follow and desire to be a part of that. It's nothing violent. There's nothing there to, to do anything except being spiritual warfare and having spiritual leaders uh, do that. It makes a world of difference. You know, I think we saw in this, uh, I don't know if, if we can make a link between the elections that just happened and, and, and pastors, but you know, it looked like to me that uh, clearly the pro-life position was the one to take if, if you wanted to get elected this, this last term. Exactly. Maybe that'll encourage pastors to say, you know, the pro-life position isn't that weird fringe element. This is this is mainstream America. Most people are pro-life, and the, and the polls, of course, show that. Um, exactly. Maybe that will encourage these guys to to become more active. Well, I'm I'm sure they will because they're seeing more and more people involved. The elections certainly see that in Harris County, which includes all of Houston, for example, which is a large uh, county. There was not one. Uh, pro-death judge elected. Every judge is a pro-life judge. Of course, Texas, year. in general, was a wipeout for the pro right. Um For the first time since, since the Civil War, the Texas legislature now is completely controlled by Republicans. There is not one statewide office in Texas that's not held by the Republicans, the vast majority of whom claim to be pro-life. Right. So um, I'm hoping that these pastors then can can be emboldened a little bit, and, and, and then with the help with your organization and Priest for Life, then they can actually start going out and doing something. They know that they're not out there twisting in the wind by themselves. Exactly, and that's a good point, Mark. Many pastors have in their heart a desire to get involved, but not by themselves. Right. But if there's someone alongside of them, shouldering with them, and they see that this is happening, they jump right in, and, I, and that's what we provide, an opportunity to do that. Well, that's great. You're doing great work, and we'll have you back, uh, not next month, but the month after. I look forward to Father it. Father Pavone will be here next month tell us what kind of trouble he's in. So. <laughs> okay, We we'll look to see you in two months. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, Sonny. When I return, we've got a retired Pittsburgh police sergeant and an abortion mill guard with a real interesting story to tell us. Welcome back. I think you're going to find this guest very interesting. David Allman comes to us from Pennsylvania. Hello, David. How are you? I'm fine, Mark. You have, I think, a very, very interesting story. Um, first off, let me give people a little bit of your background. You were a Vietnam veteran. Yes, sir. 
You were in the Pittsburgh Police Department for yes, almost 30 years, I understand. Yes, sir. Rose to the rank of a sergeant. Yes, sir. You also worked as a uh, security guard at an abortion mill there. I did, yes. Is that correct? Um, and I don't think I'm revealing any deep, dark secrets because you're pretty open about it. You had a pretty bad drinking habit. Yes, sir. You did. Uh, but that all, the Lord took that away from you. Get, tell us how that, let's start with that story first because I think that leads into the rest of it. Um, I had been drinking Jack Daniels for a good six and a half, almost seven years at the rate of 12 ounces minimum a day for that length of a period of time, which equates to around 520 gallons. One day I, I woke up and I was tired of it, and I went out to my apple orchard at my farm and, and asked God to take it from me, and instantly the desire was gone. I didn't need man to tell me that I don't need a drink. I didn't need a doctor. I didn't need medication. God removed it from me. Instantly. Instantly. He didn't take it a little bit at a time. Instantly. Right. And I told my pastor at my church uh, of the saving grace that I received for, from God in, in, in the belief of in my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and I wanted to do a testimony to the congregation of that. And he said yes. And I was preparing my testimony on a Monday prior to uh, the, the following Sunday, and I uh, went out to the apple orchard again and was just preparing my soul, preparing my heart, cleansing everything. And I thank God for all that he had done for me, that he took what I asked from me, and at once I received a visitation. I mean, it, it was the most incredible feeling I've ever had. The abortion mill was revealed to me, something that I had hidden deep inside my heart for a good 10 years. I had never given it any thought. At once my legs became like concrete, my feet were like lead, and I was frozen in a position. And I mean frozen, I was six hours, I could not move. And I immediately asked for forgiveness for, for the sins at the clinic, for enabling and allowing literally 10,000 or greater babies to be murdered. And although I know my God is a forgiving God, not necessarily a patient God, um, I was further instructed to offer apologies to those people who I offended. Of course, I can't apologize for the souls that aren't here anymore. But I, when I was able to start moving, then I, I wrote an apology to Operation Rescue. I prepared an apology to the community. Now, understand that I live 100 miles north of Pittsburgh now. The community where the, the clinic was, was a hundred miles south, and my wife tried to argue with me that the community was in Pittsburgh, and I had to assure her that Pittsburgh girls didn't use the clinics in Pittsburgh, they went elsewhere. The girls that did use the clinic that I worked at were from where I now live, they're from Ohio, New York, West Virginia, and I had to get, I, I, I had to get the children of God to forgive me. And I think I've done a good job. I think they've all forgiven me. I hope that Operation Rescue was, geez, I, I offended them greatly. And the apology or, or the, the forgiveness that I was given was the most incredible writing I've ever read. You know, I know that you heard back from Randall Terry and from, and from others in Rescue. Um, you, you have to understand, and I think you do, these people understand the concept of forgiveness. If you can't forgive, you cannot be forgiven. Yes. And, uh, you know, there's an old saying, I've, I've said it here on Life Talk before, that uh, a man that cannot forgive burns a bridge over which he will one day need to travel. Yes, sir. And that's true for every one of us. And so that doesn't really surprise me. I mean, you seem a little surprised that they were that forgiving, but it doesn't really surprise me knowing who we're talking about here. Well, I, I, I'm surprised only to the fact that it was uh, seven years of violence. Right. Yeah, and I want to I want to address that issue. You, um, again, you were a, a sergeant in the Pittsburgh Police Department yes, for twenty nine years. Is yes, that correct? Sir. Yes, sir. And then you worked when you were off duty as a security guard in an abortion mill. Yes, sir. Um, and you openly told me last night at dinner that you considered yourself not only because of your experiences in Vietnam, but on the police force and then working at the abortion mill, that you considered yourself a violent person. I was a violent person. Yes. Um, 
if you look at the history of the rescue movement, they'll tell you that the three most uh, uh, violent cities that they ever went to were Los Angeles, California, Bridgeport, Con Connecticut, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yes, sir. And you're telling me that you were part of that violence in Pittsburgh. I probably was the root of the violence in Pittsburgh. And then these people came to forgive you. Yes, sir. Did you ever go to the in front of the church and ask for forgiveness oh. on the abortion issue? <laughs> yes, I did. Yes, I did. Uh, I asked my pastor for that moment, and I said, I asked him if he thought it should be done. He said, if, if you were visited, then it needs to be done. I said, I just wanted to make sure it was all right with you. And I did go before the congregation. The temperature in the church seemed to have dropped a good 30 degrees that day. There was a lot of, I don't know that, that they were cold towards me because of my revelation to them or the fact that because of the person I am now, they were totally astounded that I could have been that person then, 10, ten years ago. But have they accepted you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, they're good Christians. I mean, I, I, uh, the youth group, uh, all the, the, the main parishioners are in the youth group with me. Uh, Bible study, it's just, a, it's just a grand time. And they've all forgiven me. What do you think, uh, having been there on the, on the, on the other side of the, of the picket line, let's say, in the, in the Operation Rescue days, what do you think led these particular police departments to be so brutal toward the pro-lifers? Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's because they thought that they were imposing the laws of man on the sidewalk counselors. And understand the officer, when I was there, I was working as a private consultant, more or less, to the, to the clinics. So I was duty-bound to them because they're the one that paid me actually blood money. So you're money. enforcing their rules. Their rules, not man's rules. I, I was okay. imposing... I was trying to impose man's law against God's will. When I would respond to the clinics in the duty status, now I was upholding man's law. And, and there is, to me, a difference. I took an oath to uphold the law. But while I was working at the clinic, it wasn't man's law that I was upholding. It was the law of the clinic. So what they told you to do, you did. I did. And I did it very well. Right. Do you? I know that you know that the people that you that you acted against are forgiven you, and you know that God has forgiven you, clearly. Oh, absolutely. Have you forgiven yourself? No. No. Are you working on that? Yes. Yes. Because, you know, it's like, it's like a lot, so many women that we deal with that have had abortions, uh, they'll say, I talk to them almost every day, either on the phone or they're here or whatever, and they'll say, I know God has forgiven me for having killed my child, but I have never been able to forgive myself. Yes. And it's interesting that, that for human beings, we have that limit, we place that limit upon ourselves. We understand that the God of the universe, who created everything in, in the universe, is capable of forgiving us. But then we don't forgive ourselves for the things we've done. Right. Yeah. It's, and that's a burden you have to carry. That's the cross you bear. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's real easy for somebody who's never been in your situation to say, well, if God can forgive you, then just forgive yourself and go on about your business. It's not that easy when you've, when you've been there. Right. I mean, I, I liken it to, you know, uh, the commandant of, of the camps in Germany, you know, he, he knew it was happening, he allowed it to be happening, uh, and that's what I did. I allowed right. innocent blood to, to die. I, I could have stopped it. On a few occasions, I did stop it, but that doesn't negate the fact that I still have over 10,000 that I didn't stop. And you were interfering with the people who were trying to stop it. Yes, oh, I, I yes. Yes, and, I did. You know, I, I, I sensed that in you either last, even last night or, and then today that you haven't come to grips with it on a personal level. You've accepted Christ's forgiveness. You've accepted the forgiveness of Operation Rescue, but you're still... Oh, I, I'll never right. forgive myself for it. I no, can't. no, don't say that. I mean, because, you know, God can help you in that area as yes. well. So we, well, he is, but right. I, I... Right. I'm a hard man on myself. Right. I was hard on the, on the rescuers, and, and I have to be doubly hard on myself. I, I can't... I can't forgive myself. Well, right. David, I, I want to thank you for coming and sharing this with us. It, I know it was difficult for you, and you've, you had to travel to do it and didn't want to do that. But I want to uh, tell you that we'll be praying for you to deal with, with the forgiveness that you can give yourself. And um, I think you're going to find that uh, the people who watch this show 
will be praying for, your, for you to forgive yourself. They don't need to ask God to forgive you because he's already done that. That happens Instant. like that. Yeah, but I didn't accept it. Yeah. Right, <laughs> yeah, right. But uh, we'll all be praying for you, David, and um, uh, just know that, that there are people out there that care about you and that, that will be doing that for you. Sure, and I thank you for having me. It was thank a pleasure, and, and if you need me back, I'll be more than happy. Well, to we're going to get you back, David. Well, thank you. Thank you, sir. Next up, Life Dynamics General Counsel Ed Zelensky will be joining me to bring you up to date on some new developments in the Jim Cop case. Welcome back. You know, we wrote a report on the Jim Cop situation in which we said we didn't know whether he did it or not, but it sure seemed like there was a fix in on the, on the evidence that was against him. And uh, now Jim Cop claims that he's going to, or is confessing that he did actually shoot at Slepian, uh, the abortionist that was killed in Buffalo, New York, uh, but that he didn't mean to kill him. It was an accident to kill him. I'm joined now by Ed Zelensky, General Counsel for Life Dynamics, who also helped us in the, in the preparation of that report that we did and actually went to, to uh, France to visit with Jim. Um, Ed, are you convinced? No, I'm not convinced of anything, Mark. What is interesting here is he makes a statement to news reporters in an interview where his lawyer is present. None of this is before court, none of it's under oath, and there's a whole lot of gaps in this thing. I'll tell you, I don't know if Jim Cobb did it or not, but the mystery still continues. Well, to me, the mystery deepens mm -hmm. because... I, you know, we may be just, may, maybe you and I are nuts. I don't know. Maybe the rest of the world is, is in step and we're out of step. But the thing that I'm not convinced of is all the jicky information, all the jicky evidence, the lying by the FBI, which is, is undeniable. Yeah. The, the planning of evidence, which is undeniable. Their, their statements that they made to the press, which are on record. No matter what Jim Cop says, it doesn't change that. Well, Mark, and Jim Cop's own statement does not match up with the evidence that the, that the police have presented. And that's right. And remember... No attorney can ethically present someone and ask them to plead guilty to something they didn't do, neither a prosecutor nor a defense counsel. And that's why the law in every state requires that evidence that corroborates the confession must be introduced. Now, what's interesting here is we've got a whole lot of elements of evidence that don't corroborate anything. And some people are going to say, well, why would a guy plead guilty if he wasn't well, guilty? Well, I was going to ask you this. You were a prosecutor. Right. And you were a defense, criminal defense attorney. Mm -hmm. Have you ever in your life known of a guy confessing to a crime oh, yeah. that he didn't do. Absolutely. What happens is, it's the same rationale that a person kills himself for. There's all kinds of factors that come into play. Fatalism. Gee, I can't do anything about this. You know, I don't want to go to trial. I'm scared. I'm depressed. You've got a desire to protect another, which is very common. Oftentimes, you'll see a situation where a defendant will say, you know, I can take the rap instead of someone else taking the rap. Then you have a desire for publicity that exists in some people. I want to be important, or I want something to be important, so I'm going to highlight it this way. And then there are some deals that are made, not necessarily with any state or federal prosecutor, but with someone else. If you'll do this, I'll do that. In the mob, they call it taking the pipe. Somebody takes the plea for an event that somebody else did. Well, I, you know, um, and sometimes there's this, and I, which I think two factors are at play here. Like I said, again, we want to reinforce. You and I don't know whether Jim Cop did it or not. We were not in Slepian's backyard. Right. The evidence doesn't point to him. It points right. to other, other directions. I think there's a on, uh, false sense. I, I, I do believe that Jim Cop is protecting somebody else. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this a year ago. Right. Well, Mark, here's some factors that come into play. He's making this supposed confession stating all these things. He won't answer simple questions. For example, why did you bury a weapon in the backyard that supposedly you're using all the time? Why would you bury it at a place you just shot somebody? And why, wait a minute, and how do you do it? He, he, the police say they were there two minutes after the crime. He says it took him three minutes to get out of the neighborhood. How do you bury the gun in three minutes, get out of the neighborhood before the police get there, you bury it so well they don't find it for five right. and a half months? Interestingly, in our investigation, when we went to Pittsburgh to try to find out about this location of right. Mr. Cop at the time that this weapon was purchased, those people in Pittsburgh didn't know what we were looking for. Right. How do you make up a story about facts you don't know? And the documented evidence in Pittsburgh supports the fact that Cop is there, yet he's saying he purchased this gun. But I'll tell you, the most interesting part of this whole thing and nobody's talked about it, is the gun doesn't match the bullet that killed Slepian. We know from the Maryland shooter cases, they're popping rounds into trees, and they're not defaced enough so that they can't make a match, and in every one of those shootings, they make a match. Come on, folks. Right. And then, not only that, but then the FBI comes out and lies about it, and says that you can fire consecutive bullets from the same gun, 
and the bullets not match. That's an out and out ball. You notice that FBI person wasn't in any of these Maryland cases where they talked about that, right? So, uh, so I mean, they're they're tying him to crimes uh, all over the country now. These two guys, right? Off, not in complete bullets, segments, fragments of bullets. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we we could go into all the evidence. But the bottom line is, um, Ed, I don't know for how you feel about this, but for me, the fact that Jim Cop is saying, "Yeah, I did it." doesn't change the evidence one bit. Mark, it adds more mystery. You've got a guy, Paul Cambria, ready to try the case. You've got an no, interesting fact. For those who don't know, Paul Cambria was the lawyer that he just fired right. and hired this pro-life lawyer, and then all of a sudden we got this nonsense right. going but on. But several weeks ago, this lawyer who's now representing Cop was representing uh, Miss Mara, was not willing to try the case when the federal government wasn't willing to try the case. The federal government didn't want to try the case because they'd have to prove the cop Mara case. Mara is the people that are under, Malvasi and Mara are under indictment for helping right. Jim escape. What's fascinating is the prosecutors are coming to him wanting to make a deal. In fact, there was a four-hour debate in a courtroom with a very upset federal judge saying, why are you entering a plea in this case? And the federal government was trying to get out of yeah. it, saying because of the problems in the cop case. But the bottom line is this. Guilt is always supposed to be established by evidence beyond a reasonable doubt that is based on physical evidence, verifiable facts. Not conjecture, not emotional responses, not statements by anybody that can't be corroborated. The proof will be in the pudding. If it can be corroborated, then cop makes a confession, he must be it. But if it can't be corroborated, the mystery gets deeper. Yep, and it, and it continues to do so. Right. Thanks, thanks for being with me, Ed. That's all the time we have for this month. Again, I ask you not to forget your donation to Life Dynamics. Like I've told you so many times before, there is nothing Life Dynamics can do to stop this Holocaust if we don't have your financial support. On behalf of my family and everyone else at Life Dynamics, I want to wish you and your family a very Merry Christmas. And let's pray that none of us ever forget what the real meaning of this holiday is. Until next time, remember, Life Dynamics is not here to put up a good fight. We're here to win, because winning is how the killing stops. We'll see you in January.